Well, okay, so let's start. All right, so uh, welcome again to the Introduction to Statistical Learning using Python. Uh, we're in Chapter 8, which is titled Tree-Based Methods. So the learning objective is to familiarize ourselves with the concept of the decision trees algorithm uh, to model relationships, again, between uh, predictors and an outcome or response. Uh, we're going to compare and contrast different tree-based models. For example, decision tree, which is the simplest one. Then we're going to be talking about bagging, about boosting, random forest, and then a little bit about BART, which is Bayesian additive regression trees. And the bagging, the boosting, random forest, and BARDs are what are called tree-based ensemble methods, right? So let's start here. Okay, so I took a, you know, I basically copied most of the theory that I found in the in the same book, but with the R version. And in the introduction, the three base methods, what they do is that they stratify or segment. In other words, they chop off what is called the predictor space. And you will see it in a plot, what I mean by that, into a number of regions. Those regions are going to be the, the basis for our prediction. So it's something different from what we have seen in, in linear regression, for example, or in lazy regression, where we are taking all those predictors and trying to find a formula to minimize the parameter. In this case, in the linear regression, is basically the, the least squares, you know, uh, parameter. Uh, here, what we're trying to do is just capture those nonlinear relationships into those uh, predictors uh, spaces. So it's a different, it's a, it's a different bending, but visually you will see that it's pretty intuitive to understand. And that's why we, we use it because they're simple and useful for interpretation. In fact, their decision trees are one of the easiest algorithms that we can find to interpret. In other words, we can see exactly what is going on uh, under the hood. Uh, bas basic, uh, basically, the decision tree is the simple one. Uh, one of the disadvantages, apart from the overfitting you know, problem, is that they are not competitive uh, with some of the most advanced supervised learning approaches like uh, the bagging, random forest, and boost. In fact, random forest is uh, is based on bagging, okay? The other thing that like random forest adds some additional uh, iterations uh, to the bagging, but it's, it's a bagging uh, tree and sample. And of course, boosting, uh, one of the most successful uh, algorithms out there for, my, for supervised machine learning is XGBoost, extreme, extreme boosting. And it's based on this concept of boosting that we're going to talk about. Okay. Um, of course, with the decision tree, the simple tree, uh, is easier to predict. It's easier to interpret, sorry. But the bagging, random forest and boosting, they kind of get a little more complex in the interpretation. They get better at, at accuracy and you know uh, metrics, but then we lose a little bit of the predictability, and they can be applied to both regression and classification. So let's see an example. The, the first example in the book is our regression trees, and we're going to take a look at the hitters uh, data set. Uh, I took a license here. You know, I was doing the, the corner. Uh, document, and I had a, a couple of issues with the Python um, uh, uh, cells, so I took a license and did it in, in R. So, but you can see here, I have a version in a Jupyter notebook of the same uh, data set. Okay, let me let me get the. And again, the Jupyter notebook. You can follow me here. Okay, let me use the chat here. 
okay, this is where the notes are, okay, in the book, uh, my my repo, book club IS, ISLP. And also, you can check this notebook, okay, which is the um, uh, a version in Python, what we're going to discuss in, in this chapter, right? Okay, so let me go back here. So in, in this uh, uh, data fetch, which is statistics based on, uh, you know, baseball players in the Major League Baseball uh, Association, um, we subset this data set into a couple of uh, variables. So our interest is to um, predict this number, the log, the log of salary. This is the salary. This is the log. And you will see why they're using the log. Because that was one of the questions that I had when I was approaching this. So the response is the log salary. And then you have hits for each of the players and the years uh, playing in the, in the league. OK, so we want to use this as predictors to this uh, log salary. So if you go back to the Jupyter Notebook, you will see why, OK? And this is the original salary uh, distribution. And as you can see, it's highly skewed, right? Uh, apparently, there's a lot of outliers in this region. So what the log is doing is kind of you know, normalizing. Uh, go, go, Gaussian, trying to trying to get a more Gaussian or normal distribution. Usually, but this is interesting because usually in decision trees you don't need to do this. Okay, and that's one of the advantages of uh, decision trees. You don't need to really uh, normalize your your response or even your predictions. Okay, they're very robust for outliers. But if I'm going to compare this algorithm with a linear regression, then the linear regression you re you need to normalize uh, your, your variables and your responses. So a Gaussian distribution will go uh, in in accordance with the assumptions that the linear regression will do. So if you want to compare that, then you know it's it's a it's it's, e it's easier to do it uh, using using this transform. But the decision trees they don't necessarily need this. Okay, so now that we have, you know, kind of the background here, uh, the authors uh, present us with, uh, with this plot, okay? And this plot, these points are the salary, the log salary, right? Okay, the, the, sal the, sal the, 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 the original salary uh, points. Then you have the years in the x-axis and you have the hits. And as you can see, what they're doing is stratifying the salary. In other words, they divided the salary between low salary, which is a threshold that they're using, a blue and green, and then the high and yellow. So uh, question for the audience, uh, what do you notice here in this plot? Uh... Mm -hmm. I'll say the lower salary players are kind of sometimes like less years and also less hits. Like the Correct. higher salary people, yeah, there are more years and more hits for sure. Correct. Yeah. Uh, years, when they increase, usually the salary increase and also with the with the hits too. But if we try to fit a linear regression here is not very uh, it's not very intuitive, right? I mean, we can we can do it, but the the points are all over, right? You know, they're not concentrated, or the correlation is not that apparent here with salary, with years, and with it. So this is a, a good you know uh, uh, a problem, a data set, a problem. Uh, for decision trees, because decision trees, they don't care about the relationship, you know, the relationship between year, salary, and the response. They only care about what is the cutoff, okay, of each of these uh, parameters. 
And if you run uh, decision tree, let me let me show you the uh, the the you know the the code in Python. Uh, you you know you you do all the you know all the imports, etc. Decision tree of SK Learn, the pandas, everything. Uh, this is a function for just printing. You know, a helper function for printing the the, the, the tree model. So once you do the log, you instantiate, right? You instantiate your decision tree. Uh, we're going to limit the leaf nodes, and we're going to talk about the terminology of the decision trees. We're going to limit the tree nodes to three uh, here. Okay, so there are only there are going to be only three leaf nodes of three predictions. And then when you instantiate that, then you fit it, right? And you fit your X, which is the predictor. And then your Y, which is the log of the seller, right? So this is a graph of what, you know, the, the same thing that is presented in the book. Okay. So we have years, and we'll see why years is the first, you know, the root node, the first parameter that we have. So anything less than 4.5 years goes to one, you know, place. And this is your leaf node here, your prediction. 5.11. So anything less than 4.5 years regarding all the hits is going to be 5.11, the, the log of the salary. You have to expon exponentiate that so that you can get the true value. Then everything above 4.5 years, then you go to hit. And if it is less, more than 4.5 years or less, then that player got less than 116.5 hits, then the salary should be six, okay? Which is an average of their of that space, uh, predictor space. If it's more than that, then it's 6.4. And those are your predictions right here for the salary, okay? A any comments so far? Not right now, thanks. Not right now, okay. So here we got the same thing. The only thing that we got a little more information, okay? So for the first rule node, we got a square error, and the square error is very important. It's the residual of the sum of the squares, right? The, the, the measurement. And here, that's why years is at the top, because years is the variable compared to hits, is the variable that has the least uh, square errors, okay? Then, that, that threshold, it has an alg the algorithm calculates more or less which is the threshold that uh, gives us the you know the minimization of this residual square error, which is 4.5. So 4.5 is going to be the threshold to divide between the values less than 4.5 and the values more than 0.5. The same thing with the hits. And these leaf nodes are the predictions for those kind of you know uh, uh, observations so let's go here which is the same that we have here okay so what is what is doing the decision tree is doing is that it's creating this space okay the work creating because we limit our predictions to three three leaf nodes okay and the leaf nodes let me explain that so we can cover all bases here Okay, this is your root node, right? It's, a, it's like an inverted tree, right? You got your root node, which is the top of the, you know, of the decision tree. Then you start splitting uh, your, your space, your predictor space uh, between, you know, a, a threshold, in this case, years less than 4.5. Then you have a decision node. And eventually you're going to, and in a node that is called the terminal node or the leaf node, where there's no more splitting. And that's your that, that's your prediction. You know, for each of these other splits, eventually you're going to finish at the end of the leaf, you know, the branches, the leaves, etc. Just try to picture a tree. And those terminal nodes are the prediction. Okay, depending if it's a regression, it's going to be a number. If it's a classification, it's going to be a layer. All right. So let's go here. So what happened here is that, remember that for 4.5, right? The years. 
So that was our first, you know, split. So we're splitting this region between the points that have less than 4.5 and the points that have more than 4.5. In the 4.5 region, there was no split. This is the R1. So the prediction is going to be the mean, the average of all these points. Okay, and all these points, the average is 5.107, right? Then, when we split the years and we get more than 4.5, then the hits get into the mix and we're going to split again in the hits between 117, which is this number, all above, all, up, all below 117, R2, and all above, R3. Everything with years more than 4.5. And the R2, the prediction is going to be the average of these observations, which is 5.9986. And in RR3, the prediction is going to be the average of all these 6.74. All right? That's how we get those you know, predictions, those, those numbers. All right? Any comments so far? So far, so good. We're good? Okay, good. All right? So, what is the interpretation here? If we see again, if we see again this tree, this very simple tree, we can say that the years, the variable of years, is the most important factor because it's the top, you know, it's, it's the top variable here. It's the one that has the least, uh, <coughs> sorry, with the least square errors with that threshold, 4.5. So years is the most important factor in determining salary. So players that are less experienced, that have less years in the league, event, yeah, you know, we can say that they earn, in average, they earn lower, a lower, a lower salary than the more experienced players. So given that a player is less experienced, the number of hits that he made in the previous year seem to play a little role in the salary. And that's why we're getting this number here, because when the player is less than 4.5 years, you don't see a split in him. So the hits is irrelevant. Here. The hits are relevant when the player is older, he is, you know, the, the, his years are uh, more, greater than 4.5. Then the hits play a role. Right? So among players who have been in the major leagues for five or more years, the number of hits made in the previous year does affect salary. Players who made more hits that year tend to have higher salaries, and we can see it right here. Okay? So in the hits, if the player hit more than 170.5, which is the, the threshold, the demarcation point, then they, in average, have a, a, a bigger salary and an and, and, and increased salary. If he, if he clean less, then they have a lower salary. And of course, you know, it says that this is surely an oversimplification. But compared to a relation model, it is easy to display, interpret, and explain. Okay. So this is the, you know, the the the, the algorithm, the mathematical, you know, uh, formula uh, of how the the regression tree is is built. Okay. Uh, the the main thing here is that those regions. It's regions. I mean, right now we can see it clearly because we only have two uh, two variables. If we add more variables, then you know, we're not going to see this. In fact, you know, if we add one more variable, which is a three dimensional model, we can see them in three dimensions. But then, if we add another one, a four dimensional, then you know uh, we cannot visualize what is happening. But at least you know you get the idea of what is uh, how the tree is being. And one of the major takes here is that each of those predictions are averages. Okay, they're, they're mean of that region, that box, a region of space that the predictor is saying that that's the that's the that's the prediction. Okay. Um, let me see something here. Okay. 
So in the recursive binary splitting, which is what is called a top-down uh, approach, uh, top-down because it begins at the top of the tree and the society splits the predictor space. The years first, which is the you know the 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 the, the least as a uh, residual square where uh, uh, some squares RSS in regression, and then the greedy part is because each step of the building tree process, the best split is made on the particular step rather than looking ahead and picking up a split that will lead to a better tree in some future step. So the best split is made at a particular step at a particular pressure, right? Uh, this is basically the iteration. It's explaining the iteration of the, you know, of, of, of how the, the 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 tree is being built with the splittings, etc. Uh, one of the things that I would recommend here is to watch, you know, after this is to watch, you know, this uh, this series from StackWeb of decision trees. This is for classification, but there's one for regression, and it explains very clearly. How is the rule node, uh, you know, selected for each of the trees, and how is the threshold also selected? So let me let me put it in the in the chat. So it stays in the log. This is the one for classification, but there's another one for uh, regression. Okay. Uh, All right, so so here the authors they are explaining, you know, how the the splitting occurs, uh, the process of the cut point of the you know the threshold, the cut point, etc., uh, the iteration that is happening. Uh, one of the things that you should be aware is that decision trees, one of the disadvantages of decision trees is that they tend to overfit the data. Why? Because uh, depending on the on the depth of the tree, for example, right now, we set a parameter of the maximum terminal nodes of three, you know, for, for the example. But if we take all the all, all the predictors, and start building a tree, a tree without any arguments is going to be a very uh, deep, deep tree. And what happens is that if the tree is too deep, in other words, it has many levels, what is happening is that then that noise in the data is going to be taken as information for the split. So for example, you can trim these trees by the depth which is, you know, how many levels do you want the decision tree to have? And also by the number that you want to be the minimum number for the split. So for example, if you say in the arguments, you establish that you should not split uh, the decision in the decision loop, you should not split if there's less than X number of, of observations. For example, 10 observations. So it's going to stop the splitting, going to stop when they are less than example 10 observations. So that way you don't include that much noise into the, the split. And that's what really overfits uh, the tree. The, the information that is not you know, relevant you know, to the whole prediction. Okay. Um, so one of the things that they, you know, show us here is to prune uh, a tree, right? So uh, it's very vicious, right? If, if you have a tree, imagine a tree that is growing wild. <laughs> it's growing wild. In other words, you know, the leaves everywhere, branches and all that. So if you want to prune a tree, what you do is just visualize the form of the tree, like a round tree or something, and then you start cutting the excess of it. So something similar, uh, the, the authors are going to show us. And to prune a tree, let me show you this. Uh, this is the formula, OK? Uh, the formula didn't go very well here with the latex you know, in, the, in the quarter document. 
I have no idea why. <laughs> but here's I the think, form. Okay. I think it's the sigma at the beginning. I think you're missing the sigma. This this one? This thing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that I had to uh, I had to tweak it a, a little bit. Okay. Yeah. You know, sometimes you know there's almost he needed a space, sometimes he, he didn't need a space, and but I have mm -hmm. to still, you know, work a little bit more. But this is the formula that we're talking about, the, the, what is called the cost complexity formula. And it's similar, it's similar to the uh, regularization that we discussed in chapter, uh, I think it was chapter seven, so chapter six or seven, uh, you know, the rich regression, lesser regression. So you have the formula of the, in, in regression, you have the formula of minimizing the residual sum of the squares. This is the formula for the residual sum of the squares. But then you add a penalty. And the penalty is going to be the penalty applied to the absolute value of uh, uh, lower uh, uppercase T. And that uppercase T is the number of terminal nodes of the tree. In other words, how many terminal nodes do you want in that tree? But apply, instead of giving a number, uh, letting this formula dictate with alpha, okay? Dictate which number of three is the optimum, you know, to, uh, to avoid the overfill, all right? So if we look at this, for example, of the hitters uh, data set, uh, we include all the nine, uh, you know, uh, variables, predictors, and uh, let the, you know, let the, <laughs> the tree go, go wild, okay? So you have this kind of tree, right? All right? So you have the RBIs now, you have the hits, you have the walks, the years, everything. So here, you have to do a cross-validation, of course, uh, for the for the cost uh, uh, pruning, cost complexity pruning. So what do we see here in this graph? Now, tell, tell me what you see. What, what is happening here? Like after a certain, it's it's showing you like the overfitting, mm -hmm. kind of like you're decreasing Correct. the mean square error for the training set, but for the mm -hmm. test set, it's like yeah, you're getting more error. Like right. it's like around three was like the sweet spot or so. Like ah uh, yeah. So. If for example, we we start here right with a with a tree size of one, the simplest one right. Just, a, just the split and the, and the root. Then we start growing the trees. But what happens is that the lower part is the uh, the mean square error, uh, you know, calculated by the mean square error of the training data. Then the dark orange is the test data, right? Our test data out of the bag, you know, uh, uh, data set. And it starts diverging after three, right? After after three size three, it starts diverging, and then the cross validation confirms also that divergence. Okay, so what they say is that a three size of three is the one that has the minimum uh, M, uh, MSC MSC without overfitting because here it starts to overfit. Okay, the training goes down. And the test is just, you know, kind of, you know, go up or level, whatever. Okay. So that's one method. I saw in an article, I saw that there was another method, okay, of uh, achieving this, but it is with uh, using variable importance. So, for example, in this training set, you will see that there's some variables that are more important than others. For example, years apparently is one of the variables. Also, hits another one. So, what you do is choose the top variable importance, let's say three or four. You choose those, you run this model, and in that article, they achieve a better, uh, you know, a better uh, metric. Uh, the M, you know, then we're using the MSC or the root and mean square error. They achieve a better one, they increase it, not without overfitting. Okay, so uh, th there are different uh, ways, you know, to, to achieve this. 
Okay, this is the one that the authors are just presenting. So for classifications, we were doing regression. Now let's jump to classifications. Very similar. The only thing that instead of a continuous variable as a response, we're going to have a categorical, right? A qualitative uh, response. So we predict each observation, the uh, observation that belong to the most commonly occurring class of train observations in the region which it belongs. In the classification setting, are the residual of the sum of squares is not going to be useful to us because it's a label. So we have to use other uh, methods. And the authors, the first one that they introduced to us is the error rate, which is this formula, right? And this P hat, uh, MK, is, is going to be the proportion of training observations in the S region that are from the M, M or the K place. So here we're doing the maximum, right, of this, uh, of this, of this uh, parameter. So let's say that let, let, let let's 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 do the stream. Let's do a stream. So let's say that all of this uh, uh, p hat, you know, the proportion of training observation is one. The maximum is one. So that that's a perfect classifier, right? So when you subtract them by one, you get an error of zero. Right. If the maximum here is very low, let's say it's, re it's, it's going towards zero, then when you subtract by one, you get an error rate, a very high error rate, almost, almost one. So this is going to be the measure that the classification algorithm, classification base three, is going to be basing in terms of selecting the root nodes, selecting the thresholds, et cetera. One of the disadvantages of this formula, this error rate, is that it's unsuited for tree blaze classification because E does not change much as the tree grows. In other words, it's lack sensitivity. So we have to use another method, which is called the Gini index. And that is the, the method that usually is done in the algorithm, where you then, instead of just taking this parameter, P hat, MK, you take p hat and k, but then multiply it by one minus p hat and k. Okay, and this is the measure what is called total variance across uh, the k classes. Uh, the Gini index is going to be between zero and one, you know, because it's uh, you can you can you can you can visualize those probabilities. So the Gini index is going to be uh, between zero and one, and there's going to be a measure of what is called log purity. Okay. A small value indicates that a log contains predominantly observations from a single class. So the smaller the Gini index is, the most the, the better the purity of the log. And that's what is going to be used for selecting the rule node and selecting the other variables in that tree. Uh, another alternate from the Gini index is the, what is called the cross entropy. And here we introduce a lot here, okay? In terms of, you know, so that to the reduce kind of the variance here. So one of the examples that the uh, the authors uh, gave us is the hard data set. Uh, let me see, I have here the hard data set. It's an R data set, right? It's a data set containing 14 variables of 289 side patients are related to heart disease diagnosis. Uh, the class, okay, the, is the diagnosis of the heart disease. And usually is the original data set, it has four classes, but we can uh, you know, convert it to two classes, a binary class for zero, which is, doesn't have a heart, they don't have a heart disease, and then one for uh, patients with a heart disease. And this has only better that we have. So, if we, uh, you know, grow our three, our tree, uh, we'll have this. Uh, something that I notice, okay, when I run this uh, this notebook, is that I don't know if the data set is different. I don't think so. Maybe the algorithm is different in psychic learn from the R algorithm, but I got a different tree. Okay, so. 
just to make sure that you know we have that in a disclosure. For example, the rule law here is tall, right? Which is this uh, this parameter here, tall, uh, which has normal fixed defect, reversible defect is a categorical uh, feature, and then in the in the Python implementation, OPIC is the one that is the rule law. So it's a totally different tree. Okay, so but let's continue with the with the one that is uh, portrayed in the in the book. So when we go regrow this tree, right, and this is the you know the while the while tree with all the parameters, you know, no constraints, etc. You see that it's a you know kind of complex tree. This is the what is called the prune uh, tree, and this is the prune one. Okay. And this is the same uh, graph that we had in the, in the previous section for the training, cross-validation test, and so forth. Uh, one of the things that I noticed uh, here, and it's marked here in this uh, you know, box, is this parameter called REST, ECG, uh, less than one. And usually, what you have, usually what you have in this binary, you know, terminal loss binary, is kind of a no uh, or yes, depending on the classification. In this case, you know, in the, in the observation that is predicted, it has a, a heart disease or not, the, the patient. Uh, here, we have the same uh, result for the split, okay? Which is kind of, you know, kind of weird, right? So one of the things that the authors mention is that regardless, of the value of rest ECG, which is kind of, uh, let, me sh let me show you here. This is the parameter. Uh, let's see if I can find it somewhere. Okay, rest ECG, yeah, yeah, yeah. A resting electrocardiograph is of zero normal, one having a wave anomaly to so in probability, it's another, another category of variable. So here, in this, Split, okay, we get the same result. In other words, if the rest ECG is less than one, we get yes. You know, the, the patient is expected to have a heart, a heart a problem. And then more than one, also it has the uh, heart, you know, it's predicted to have the heart disease, right? So the question is, why is the split for at all if it's the same result? And it's because of the increase not purity, okay? Remember that, that Gini index that we were talking about? Uh, when you get, why, why is this important? Well, when you get new data, uh, you know, and run it through the algorithm, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do a model to predict, uh, you know, to, to predict new data. So let's suppose that we have a test observation that belongs to a region given by the right hand leaf, okay? This right hand. Here. Yeah. So then we can pretty be certain that its response value is yes. In other words, the right hand lead, we can be certain that it's yes, you know, the rest more than one. If the test observation because to a region given by the left hand lead, the one that is less than one, even though the response value, the picture value is yes, we're going to be according to the purity to the Gini index are going to be less certain, okay? So even though the split does not reduce the classification error because it's the same result, it improves the Gini index of the engine, which are more sensitive to no purity. So this is some of the things that you're going to encounter sometimes in this, uh, you know, in this decision tree. But sometimes you get the same a result regardless of the split, but there's an underlying a reason why is it doing that. Right. So, uh, you know, just to summarize, because we're running out of time here, uh, advantages of decision trees very easy to explain. They mirror human decision making. Uh, for example, uh, in the previous cohort that I discussed this uh, this book in, in, in you know using R, uh, we did uh, an exercise in terms of. 
uh, the audience was going to use the decision the decision trees to try to uh, guess what was the word that I wrote in a you know in a piece of paper. I wrote I wrote the words. So you start saying, okay, is this is this uh, you know something alive or something you know uh, not not living, you know, an object. And then if it's an object, then you know we have these characteristics. They're always binary, right? Until you get to a point that you say, okay, I, I, I know what you wrote in that paper. It could be anything, you know, computer, app, whatever. And one of the things that is also important is that decision trees handle qualitative predictors without any preprocessing, any need of the learning variable. Uh, but uh, of course, you know, there's some disadvantage, and that's what usually we don't use a decision tree as our top model. Uh, they don't have the same level of predictive accuracy. Uh, they can be non robust. In other words, they can change small changes, they can cause large changes in the estimated tree. Uh, we need an example method uh, to improve it, right? And of course, you know, it doesn't say it there, but and the question, the, the problem of error fitting is always present in the decision tree. Okay. So, any comments, questions? Or... What was the last thing you said? Uh, I think it was the overfitting, right? Um, I'm not sure. I, or... It was, I didn't hear it much. It was something you said they didn't mention in the book. So. Uh, yeah, that they don't, you know, uh, in this uh, summary, they didn't mention the overfit, uh, you know, issue, but you should be aware of that always with the decision to the simple. And yeah. usually, what what you do is that you try to trim through uh, the tree, or use uh, you know the top variable importance, like I I told uh, I said in the in the article that was I was uh, I was uh, you know reading. Okay, and also ensemble med methods which uses decision trees to create, you know, the, the predictions, they are also a method to try to overcome the overfitting uh, issue. Okay. Okay, so let's see how far can we go. So the first improvement to decision trees is bagging. And bagging the underlying uh, uh, method is what is called bootstrap, okay? And bootstrap is a fancy word for sampling with replacement, okay? So Magin uses sampling with replacement to generate, uh, you know, several, several of these trees. And what we're going to do is try to see, depending on the result of each of the trees, we're going to be doing kind of a voting you know, mechanism to try to smooth or make it more robust the the results of each of the of those trees. Okay. So uh, usually, what you are doing is you know getting like an average, uh, you know, of those terminal nodes, uh, which reduces reduces variance, etc. Why do we use the bootstrap? Because usually we only have one training set. We don't have multiple uh, training sets. That's what it's saying right here. So that's when we, we do the bootstrap. You know, take repeated examples from the, from the same uh, training set. Uh, generate the different bootstrap, you know, uh, trees, right? And then average the results. In the case of classification or each observation, you record the, the class predictor and take a majority vote. Okay, this is for the for the regression, the, the average. The classification is kind of a, the vote classifier that I was talking about. Uh, and common, usually the number of trees in those bootstrap uh, sample trees is not a critical parameter with value. A large B will not lead to overfitting. Why? Because we're taking, you know, we are trying to smooth those variances with the majority vote, you know, mechanism or with the average of the of the results of the training vote. Notes. So 
What is the out of bag error estimation? How do we estimate the test error? Pretty straightforward. So, because the trees are repeatedly feeded to bootstrap subset observations, on average, each back tree uses about two thirds of the observation. So, we're not taking the whole you know, training data set. We're going to take a, a, a subset of the training uh, uh, data set and then leave what is called the out of bag, out of bag uh, sample, out of, out of example. So we can then run the the, the bagging uh, trees with the, that training set, subset of training set, and then uh, compare it with the out of bag. In, in this case, you know, we said to serve the observations is going to be the one applied, and one third is going to be taken as out of bag. Kind of a training test, you know, a validation approach. And what it's going to do is that it's supposedly trying to, you know, get as much as closer as possible those metrics between the training set and the test set, the out of bag error, you know, to get it, you know, that they, they should not diverge that much. Uh, one of the things that I uh, research is this article, which explains a little more intuitively. Uh, what is the, the the difference between bagging and boosting? Okay, so it's a new read. So, for example, in the bagging, we're doing random sampling with risk placement, the bootstrapping uh, part, but we're not weighing our data. In the boosting, we're weighing our data, and that's part of the process of boosting, you know, different with sampling. Also, in the bagging, we're going to build the trees, but they are built independently, okay? In other words, one tree information does not feed into another tree. In the boosting, the information of one tree and the weight is going to be used for the next iteration of another tree. So there's a learning process in the boosting that is going to help uh, get a better uh, a better ensemble each time the iteration is run. So eventually from a weak learner, for a weak learner in the boosting, you're going to get a stronger learner at the end. Uh, you know, obviously trying not to overfit uh, the data, but this is one of the main differences here between the boosting. The weight of the data, of the predictors, okay, with different weights, and also the iteration in boosting, which in bagging is independent. You know, there's no communication between the trees. They're independently uh, uh, assembled. In the boosting, uh, one tree, uh, the information on the residuals of the errors get translated to the next one, okay? And then the next iteration is going to learn from the previous in terms of the weights and how to improve that ensemble of trees, okay? to try to, you know, uh, get those those concepts, you know, to, uh, together. So uh, in the in the bagging and the boosting also, uh, we don't have the explainability, you know, the explainability that we, when we can have in a, in a decision, in a single decision tree. Remember in the single decision tree, you can plug all the splittings, you know, decision trees, et cetera. Here, because each tree is independent, we have to use other methods. So the variable importance measure is going to be uh, an overall, it says here, which predictors are important, is going to be an overall summary of the importance of each predictors that can be achieved by recording how much the average in terms of regression or gene index in terms of classification improves or decreases. Okay, uh, which is three split over a given predict. So what it's going to do is going to do, and also there's another method for permutation that is that is can be used too, which is uh, you know running uh, iterations of this uh, process. But what it's going to do is that it's going to assign kind of a value to each of the of the predictors, and the largest value is going to correspond to the top 
proper nature. So in this case, tall, which was the root node, remember? In this, in this case, is going to have the, you know, the largest number, which is going to be 100, because that's the first that is going to be split, right? Then SVA is going to be the second, chest pain, the third, old peak, and so forth. So the Gini index in this case is going to give you the, the you know, the magnitude of each of these uh, predictors. And you just have to translate it to, you know, to a number in terms of relative importance within the, the whole collection. Okay. Um, let me see, we all have three minutes. So let me finish with the random forest, which is based, random forests are based on, on, on bagging, right? So one of the problems that the bagging has is that the bag trees may be highly similar to each other. So for example, a strong predictor in the data set, most of the bag trees will use this strong predictor in the task plate, right? Because they, they're not going to, you know, uh, they're not going to change that much because they're using the same mechanism for assigning the root node so far. So trees will look quite similar and predictions from the back trees will be highly correlated. And this could be an issue, right? Because we're not getting the information that we need to try to smooth, you know, this, uh, you know, the, the, the problem of the overfit. So, Averaging many highly correlated quantities does not lead to, a, to as a larger function variance as average many correlated quantities. So, what does random forest brings, you know, to the bagging to get a little more robust? So, what random forest does is that it considers only a subset of the predictors, right? So, depending on on, the, on this parameter, usually it's a, def, it's a default. A parameter here. Usually, the subset is taken by the square root of the number of predictors. So, if you have, let's say, you have nine predictors, the square root of nine is three. So, we're going to start with three. So, each tree is going to be built by a subset of the predictors, but those predictors are going to be uh, randomly assigned. Okay, they're not going to be the same uh, always. So Dutch is split, the algorithms are allowed to consider a majority of the available predictors, essentially P minus N uh, divided by P of the splits will not even consider the strong predictor given other predictors a chance. So you are going to iterate with each of these uh, you know, number of predictors, selecting randomly each of the three, so that that strong predictor is not going to be always used uh, to build those trees. And this, what it does is decorrelates the trees and make the average of the resulting trees less variable, more reliable. The only difference between bagging and random forest is the choice of predictor subset, the M. Right? Uh, if a random forest is built, M equal P, that's just bagging. In other words, bagging is just taking the whole, you know, a number of predictors. That's it. Random forest just takes a subset of those predictors. So for both, we build a number of decision trees on both structure and itself. And this is the example for, uh, for the gene expression data, which is a highly dimensional uh, data set. We don't have, you know, at least, you know, the authors didn't include the, you know, the information in this data set. They just, you know, uh, explain it. Uh, it's a measurement of 4,718 genes measured on tissue samples from 329 patients. And it's a high dimensional because it has around 500 uh, you know, uh, genes or predictors in this case. So what they show you is, is that the orange, the light orange line is going to be the bag, okay? With M is equal to P, right? M is equal to the number of predictors, the whole thing. Then we have a blue line, which is the predictors divided by two. So we only want to use half of the predictors available. In other words, two fifths. But then in the light green line, we get the random forest. We get the square of P, which in this case is going to be the square root of 500, which is less, I, I believe is less than P divided by two. 
And as you can see, you get a better uh, test classification error using that you know, random forest, right? Okay, so it's three already. So let's stop here.